My name is Justice and I serve on our production team. We're so excited to have you here with us. This Wednesday, July 7th, we're kicking off our Summer Pulpit Series. This week, we're hearing from Franco Martinez. Come join us for an awesome night of worship and time to connect following the service with ice cream and treats outside on the patio. During our Summer Pulpit Series, we're offering a summer fun program for our kids and youth group for our teenagers. At the end of the month, we will have water baptisms on July 28th. If you've never been water baptized and would like to be, scan the QR code at the bottom of the program to register. The best way to stay connected at HTC is to sign up for a Realm account. Realm is a great way to find a life group, register for upcoming events, connect with people at HTC, and give. If you have any questions about Realm, head to our Connect desk for more information. Church, we love you and hope you have the best day ever. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Happy 4th of July. God bless America.
We're so glad that you've joined us for worship today. You, you know, sometimes when we worship, we just punch a hole right through heaven. How many of you know that we punched a hole right through to heaven during our worship this morning? God is with us, and we're glad that you're with us too. want to welcome everybody that's worshiping with us online. We're so glad. Did anybody get confused by the service time, or did you do all right with our new schedule, our 1030? Do you like this 1030 worship time? I like it too. We want to thank you for your loving financial support of Harvest Time Church. In just a moment, the ushers are going to come to wait on us for our morning offering. The Lord says in his word, bring the whole tithe into my house so that there might be food in my house. You know, it's the only place in the whole Bible that God says, test me in this and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour uncontainable blessing. How many of you like a little uncontainable blessing from the Lord? You know, giving is not only God's appointed means of supporting the work of the kingdom of God on earth, but it's his appointed means of blessing you. Um, there are a few ways that you can give this morning in your program. There's an offering envelope. You can use that offering envelope to give by credit card or debit card if you like, or slip a check inside. If you're giving by cash and you want credit for that, just make sure to write your information on the outside of the uh, offering envelope so our office can uh, credit you appropriately for your giving today. Some people like to give by text and the information for that is is on the screens behind me for those worshiping with us online and for everyone you can make a gift to Harvest Time Church anytime online at our website htchurch.com just click on the giving link on the top of the home page and uh, it'll guide you in making a secure gift online just before the ushers come to wait on us this morning uh, first of all I want to say a huge thank you to my wife Denise and to our staff and to all of our volunteers who put on a great vacation Bible school for our kids this last week. We had over 175 kids that came through Vacation Bible School, and we had over 160 volunteers. Isn't that amazing? Thank you to everyone. Come on, let's just express our appreciation to everyone that served. It was a you know, it's a great thing on the last night of Vacation Bible School, the kids all booed because it was the last night and they wanted a little bit more. The volunteers were happy it was the last night, but the kids wanted a little bit more and it was a great thing. Um, if you do want some more of that, every Wednesday in July, we're going to have a Wednesday evening program. We're doing a summer pulpit series, I'm calling it Sons of the House. I wanted to call it Sons and Daughters of the House, I'm just acknowledging some of the kids that have grown up in harvest time and are in ministry now. Um, all the daughters of the house that I contacted are so busy in the work of the ministry, they couldn't get free to come and join us. But some of our sons who have grown up here at harvest time and are now serving the Lord are coming back uh, this coming Wednesday evening our friend Franco Martinez is uh, going to be bringing the word his dad Homer is on staff with us here at harvest time uh, on July 14th Josh Guglielmo is going to be bringing the word on July 21st pastor Dan McCauley is going to be with us we're going to have a worship night and then on the 28th of July we're going to have a water baptism service if you've not yet been baptized in water since you've made a decision to follow Christ we would love for you to join us in Believer's Baptism that night. Youth group is going to be meeting every Wednesday in July, and we're going to have a summertime sports program for kids outdoors. And so we hope you'll join us and you'll be part of that. I'm going to ask the ushers if they would come. We have a picnic right after this service, and we have a lot of food. So I need you to all stay and eat some food, all right? Um, join us. We have some lawn games. Um, we have some uh, food set up outside, and before you go on with your other 4th of July celebrations, we hope that you'll join us. How many of you know that um, America was God's plan? In the scheme of human history, God planned that there should be a country called the United States of America, 
and God still has a plan for America. God has a purpose for our country. The Apostle Paul was preaching on Mars Hill and he said these words. He said, from one man, God has made every nation of men. The word is ethnicity. From one man, God has made every ethnicity. The Bible has the answer for the problem of racism. It's that we all have one father and one creator, God in heaven. And the Bible says, Paul says, that God determined the times in which they should live and the places where they should live, the boundaries, the borders of their countries. And he says that God did this so that people would reach out for him and find him because he's not far from any one of us. And then you can finish the Sermon on Mars Hills. Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. Let's pray as we give back to the Lord. Father, thank you that you lavished your very best on us when you gave us your son, Jesus. Lord, with glad and grateful hearts, we give back to you today our tithes and offerings, giving to missions for the work of the kingdom around the world. Father, I pray that you'd bless every giver in this offering today in the wonderful name of Jesus. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. God bless you while you give. Just so thankful for our worship team. I want to tell you what, I, I want you to open your hearts because we have an amazing word to hear from the Lord this morning. Just before we do, we're going to take a moment and we're going to honor America. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing the national anthem together. And after we sing the national anthem, we're going to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Joanne and Courtney and Mary, come lead us in the national anthem. They're doing an amazing job with it. If you know it and you want, I want you to sing along with them. Let's do it together. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proud stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave 
Wasn't, wasn't that awesome? Amen. So uh, our friend, remain standing if you would for just a moment, our friend Joanne, who put that together, just retired last Friday from teaching music in New York City public schools. And so happy retirement, Joanne. I, I, called her, I called her one week ago and I said, Joanne, how much do you love me? And uh, they put that together in one week. Isn't that beautiful, what they did? Awesome. I want to invite you to uh, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag. Um, so Denise and I, this August, it'll be 26 years that we're married. And um, Denise, just thank you. Denise just became a U.S. citizen a couple months ago. She was born in Canada. And so for all of these years when we've been at different functions and events and they said the pledge, Denise hasn't said the pledge. And, and I wanted to tell everybody it's not because she's protesting, it's because she's Canadian. But uh, now she can say the pledge. If you're a citizen of the United States, would you join us and let's say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag together. Come on, let's do it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Remain standing. Give a hand to Pastor Blaze as he comes this morning. Good morning, church. How y'all doing? Happy 4th of July. I know it's 4th of July, but where else would you rather be than in the house of God? Am I right? Hey, wouldn't you uh, welcome, uh, I have a dear friend, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, you've seen a promo of a guy wearing a leopard shirt and preaching and communicating, and he is here in the flesh. Pastor Nathan Finocchio is a dear friend of mine. I've known him for a decade, and uh, you're in the right place at the right time to hear this message, because he has a word to speak to what is going on in our world, but not by just going world to world, but by going kingdom world against the world. And he has a wet message, and he's been anointed and really gifted for this season, for this time to really speak to a generation, but really to speak to anybody here who loves Jesus and wants to see the kingdom of God go further in your workplace, in your neighborhood, and your, wherever God has called you. So would you, before we do that, th he runs an, an organization called Theos U. And you can go to theosu.com and find out more about it. But really what he does is he entrains and he teaches people how to talk about the things that are really coming against them, whether you're young, whether you're old, but really whether you just want to see the gospel go further. He trains and teaches people how to have the conversations through gospel, biblical principles. So find out more about that. But could we please welcome Pastor Nathan Finocchio as he comes up and speaks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, grab a seat. Grab a seat. We've been standing for at least two minutes. You're exhausted. It's horrible. That was really cool. Uh, I love singing the national anthem. My favorite national anthem, I think, that I've ever heard was when Marvin Gaye sang uh, the Star Spangled Banner for the All-Star Game in the 70s. You can find it on YouTube. It'll change your life. Um, it's really good. Um, but it wasn't as good as that one we just heard. Obviously, because we were singing it. Um, <laughs> I wonder if, if um, you would be patient with me for the next 30 minutes or so. And um, come on like a thought, thought experiment. I want to push back a little bit on some things that I think are creeping into the church and uh, some destructive thinking. Um, and so I just ask you to maybe be patient and just hear me out. Maybe at times you might be like, ah, oh, Nate, you know what? You lost me there. Just give me, uh, just be patient with me as I move through this material. Um, 
This is probably less of a preach and more of a teach today, if that's okay. Are you okay with that? Okay, so I've titled this, uh, this talk, we're gonna, I'm going to call it a talk, because it's just probably a bit more accurate. Um, I'm, I've entitled this, uh, Get Up and Eat. Get Up and Eat. Because that's what we're going to be doing today. It is July 4th, and there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be acts of gluttony that are committed today. It's going to happen. I think there's a special dispensation, though, for that, okay? Um, so you won't have to confess, okay? But that's only for today. Um, I believe that the church is called to be a prophetic witness to the world. And what that means is that, no, the church is not perfect. The church, the church, you know the reason why this church isn't perfect? It's because you're here. <clears throat> right? Like, the church is full of people, and people suck. <laughs> you know? <laughs> we can laugh about that, right? Um, it's just a reality. But... Uh, somehow and mystically, Jesus is ruling his church. And we don't abandon, you know, the Christian ideal because we fail to live up to it. No, we uphold it because it's Jesus's, right? So we're called to be a prophetic witness. For example, um, we're called to be a prophetic witness to a world that desperately needs moms and dads. You hearing me? Right? We, we believe that, that God is the designer of human flourishing, that God is passionate about people being and living up to their full potential. And so that's why we, we undergird and we, and we highlight and we encourage and, uh, you know, the, the, the family. We believe that, that an individual isn't the basic building block of society, but we believe that the family is the basic building block of society, right? Um, so in that way, we're called to be prophetic witness, and we call the world to go, hey, we believe that, that God's passionate about you, and if you will follow in his ways, however imperfectly, um, that you will flourish, right? And so we're, we're called, that's just an example of us being a prophetic witness. Obviously, we have the gospel, and we tell people the good news of Jesus Christ, but we call people uh, to, li to live the gospel also. And we're called to have gospel solutions. You know, that, that I believe that the church has solutions, for the world. I believe that this, the, the fix for racism is the gospel. I believe that. <laughs> I believe that. I believe that uh, Jesus has broke down the dividing walls, right? And there's neither Jew nor Greek, and there's no jockeying at the, at the foot of the cross, right? The, the, the powers, you know, society would love to, to pit man against woman, right? Um, but we don't believe that, that, uh, that men and women need to be at odds anymore at the cross. You know, that we can actually serve one another and love one another and, and prefer one another. Um, and then finally, we believe that we're called to give a reason for our hope. <clears throat> I believe that the church should be the pillar of truth that Paul calls the, ch the church. Did you know that the, the church is called the pillar of truth? Like, that's what we're supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> Not, once again, because we're perfect, but, but because we have the Jesus is here and we have the scriptures, right? And we have this, then this standard, this ideal that we live up to by the grace of God, imperfectly, you hear me? But we're called to give a reason for our hope. And that means you, that you're called to give a reason for your hope. And so today, what I want to kind of do is take us through some conversations that people are having in our world, conversations that are happening on Instagram, God forbid TikTok, Facebook. You know, I'm sure some of you are some are incredible keyboard warriors out there. Like my mom, my mom, man, she's incredible. She's like a, a, a ninja assassin on Facebook. <laughs> you can't get away with anything on Facebook. Jan Finocchio will find you. <laughs> um, and of course our, our speech is supposed to be seasoned with salt but we need to have uh, reason and sanity to the things that we and know the things that we believe and so that's kind of my heart today I'm going to say some things that 
are probably going to be, you know, you might be like, wow, I can't believe he just said that in church, you know. Um, but uh, I just want to, uh, I, hopefully that you hear my heart as I push back against some of these things. So um, are you ready to jump into it? Okay, then we're going to we're, we're party. We're going to eat too many hot dogs. It's going to be wonderful. Okay. Now, uh, before we get started, people aren't our problem. Worldly, fleshly, and demonic ideologies are. Right? And this is something that we often forget. That people aren't our problem. You know, we, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But against principalities and powers, etc. All right, let's keep moving. Two philosophies uh, that are entering the church. Uh, and I'm, I want to address these two head on today. And, um, and, and what I'm going to do is going to give responses to each of them. Are secularism and postmodernism, secularism and postmodernism. Now, um, I'm going to explain these um, in a moment, and then we're, um, we're going to get to them. But let me just, uh, let's just pray really quickly and just ask the Lord to guide our time. Father, thank you that you're here. Thank you that your presence is here. Thank you for America. Uh, thank you for this church. Lord, thank you that you are on the throne today and that your plans and your purposes will not be thwarted. God, thank you that everything that you purpose comes to pass. And Father, I just ask you that you would uh, equip us today, sharpen us, and cause us uh, to see uh, and know the times, people that know the times, pe prophetic people that know what is going on in the world and, and have prophetic answers and gospel answers um, to the problems in our world. And give us the boldness, Lord, to confront and to have conversations and be able to just talk things out and have conversations. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, let's start with secularism. Um, so secularism is, is essentially the idea that our societies should not have any religion, any God in them whatsoever. And that that's actually a good idea, um, that, that there should be no Christianity, that, there should, that God shouldn't be in public spaces. Um, Christians at the beginning of the 21st century began to believe this. It, it, would, it, would, it would shock you how many young people believe that Christianity and Christians shouldn't bring their Christianity into the public sphere. It's actually pretty frustrating how many Christian kids believe that today. Um, but Christianity abandoned and sort of retreated from public spaces about 100 years ago, and secularism isn't neutral. It's actually quite dogmatic. And it took up all of the space that Christianity um, uh, retreated from. And so that's kind of what secularism is. Secularism is the idea that, that our, our governments and our public spaces should not be religious. And so you might have heard a statement like this or read a statement like this. Religion should stay out of government. You know, and, and typically it's followed by, I believe in separation of church and state. Um, before I read my response, I would just say that the, the founding fathers didn't, they didn't say separation of church and state in the sense that the church should not be a part of the affairs of the state. They believed in separation of church and state in the sense that the government should never meddle in the affairs of the church. Um, so that was their design. The reason why they said that in the context was that they were all escaping Europe. And at the time in Europe, for example, in England, you had the Anglican Church, which was and is still uh, the state religion. And if you were not an Anglican, you could lose your head or a finger, you know. Um, and if, or for, for example, in France, if you were a Huguenot and you, you were essentially a Baptist uh, and you're in Catholic France, the same thing goes. The, the state would, would oppress you, confiscate your goods. And so there were all these people from Europe fleeing, and they were just sick and tired of living in nations where there was a legal or a national religion. Um, and if you, had, if you were, uh, didn't practice your faith or practice Christianity the way that the state did, uh, that you would be oppressed. And so they were thinking, the founding fathers were thinking, we're not going to do that. We're not going to have a state religion where it's married to the government. We're going to have, the government can't tell churches what to do. They assumed that the populace would be a restrained, moral Christian populace. 
They assumed that the government would always be infested with Christians. You hearing me? So it's only in the last 50 years that now secularists have turned that and twisted uh, the intention of the founding fathers and say, you know, I believe in separation of church and state. You know, and I'm going to show you just how, uh, how incompatible and, and sort of ridiculous the statement would, would be. But a response would be, well, all morality is transcendent. All morality is transcendent. As in, morals come from above. Right and wrong come from above. You know, like we had the Ten Commandments in all of our courtrooms. Like we believed that these ten, these thou shalt not kill is a God idea. You hearing me? Um, and all legislation is moral. Even tax laws are moral. Someone say amen. <laughs> you hearing me? There, are Im there can be immoral tax laws, right? And so we need a moral people to create legislation. Therefore, because all morality is trained, pe people are getting their morality from somewhere. You hearing me? And it's either a morality that is, that is from above or it's from somewhere else. You hearing me? It's a, it's a corrupt or it's, it's, it's a corruption, right? Sin is a corruption. It's not a thing. It's a corruption of a thing. And it's a there are corruptions of morality that have come from above. So our government is full of people making religious decisions. They're making moral decisions. So which religion are they getting their morals from? To say that Christianity shouldn't be, you know, Christians shouldn't bring their faith into the public sphere, is just, that's nonsensical. No, actually, we don't want compartmentalized people serving you know, in our, in our government. We want people whose faith has permeated every fiber of their being. You hear me? Right? The people that elected Senator Tim Scott and knew that op openly that he's a Christian are going, hey man, like, we, we know you're a Christian. We want you to keep being a Christian. You hear me? Right. We know the things that you stand for, and you, you believe in Jesus, and you and you you know you get. Please be that in the Senate. Please, we have democratically elected you to be that person. And thankfully, Tim Scott is the same man in the Senate as he is when he was standing before and 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 asking the public to vote for him. You hearing me? Okay. Here's another statement. Um, Religious nationalism is evil. Okay, this is a fun one. You've probably seen this one recently. Um, this is a hammer that the kids love to swing. Um, and a response could be like this. Everyone has a moral, national vision for a country and a democracy. Everybody. Every single person has an idea of what America would look like, like what good would be, right? Um, it's not that you don't like religious nationalism. It's that you don't like my religion. Right? Why is it okay? And, and this is what you some have to, some, sometimes need to ask people. You know, so people are like, well, I don't want Christians enforcing and, you know, their beliefs. I don't believe that, that um, we should enforce uh, morality or we should legislate. Have you ever heard somebody say, we shouldn't legislate morality? Really? Is slavery a moral issue? Yes, it is. Slavery is evil. Aren't you happy that we have legislation that has abolished slavery? <laughs> we should a thousand percent legislate morality. Where all legislation is moral anyways, right? It's a giant sidestep. But what sometimes we need to ask the question to people who are saying that is, why is it okay for you to force your beliefs on me? Right? So, well, don't enforce your beliefs on me. You know, like, well, why, is, why is, it, is it okay for secularism, which is a faith? It, it is a faith. It comes with more. Why is that okay, but Christianity is not? Right? This is just, it's, it's nonsensical. Okay? All right, let's keep going. I told you it was going to be spicy this morning. <laughs> this is Taco Bell spicy. It's not even that spicy. <laughs> okay, here we go. Nationalism 
And patriotism are evil. This is another good one. And kind of similar, similar to what we just said. Okay, and here's a response. Is Scottish nationalism evil? When we think of nationalism, we need to think of it in terms of other countries. Is William Wallace actually the villain of Braveheart? Remember Braveheart with, with Mel Gibson? You know, freedom! His face is all blue. Am I supposed to be cheering when he's being drawn and quartered by the British at the end? No, <laughs> right? No, no. Edward Longshanks is the villain, and William Wallace is the hero, right? <laughs> but, but we don't think of it. We just, oh, nationalism, nationalism is evil. You know, it's like, dude, what about Irish nationalism? Is that good or bad? It's good, right? Indian nationalism. Um, when, the, when, when Gandhi was going, hey, yeah, we don't want the British to rule us anymore. We sort of want self-determination. It's a good thing. You're hearing me, right? Um, how about when America was like, you know what? We kind of don't want taxation without representation. So we're going to have a tea party. You know, like, so we want self-determination. Right? Self-determination, that's what nationalism is. It's a good idea. Now, when you look through history, history, it's, humanity was basically goaded by two horns of the bull. One horn was the empire. You know, you, we go through all the empires of antiquity. You know, the Syrian Empire, and then the Babylonian Empire, and then the Greek Empire, and then the fracture of the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. And you have empire after empire, and they just, you know, they just dominate, and they kill people, and they crucify them, and they impale them, and cut their heads off. And if you don't join, if you don't do, you don't get with our plan. You know, we bring peace through killing. You know what I mean? My empire was so peaceful. I remember reading a, an Egyptian uh, pharaoh saying, when I was, you know, our empire brought brought great peace. I'm like, yeah, ask the people whose skulls you crushed. You know, like, very peaceful. So you've got empire, which is imperialism, right? Importing your, your empire everywhere. And then in, in antiquity, you have tribalism, which is just anarchy. It's, it's fighting in the streets amongst everybody, and, there's, and there's, it's very dangerous. Um, the Bible presents this third option, and it's called the nation. And in the nation... It's a people, different ethnicities in the, the, the children of Israel. Moses was married to an Ethiopian woman and a Midianite. Um, there were Egyptians that came with the Israelites. There were all types of people that joined Israel, but they had a, a collective story. And then remember, God gave them defined borders that they were not to transgress. The promised land had borders, right? And those borders represented, hey, this is your allotment, and Egypt doesn't belong to you, Right? Babylon doesn't belong to you. This belongs to you. So you can self-determine here. You hearing me? That's the story of nationalism. Nas nationalism is the story of self-determination. Self-determination is a great thing. Um, and if you read the Bible, um, we see that, wow, a nation that desires to self-determine, it's a good idea. Nationalism is not imperialism. Uh, for example, sometimes people are like, well, Hitler was a nationalist. No, Hitler was an imperialist. He wanted everybody to eat sauerkraut. And he was shoving it down people's, you know, throats with a bayonet. Right? He wanted Europe to be German. That's not nationalism. Nationalism is you stay in Germany, bro. You hearing me? <laughs> that, that's, that, that's nationalism. <laughs> Imperialism is when you're trying to import physically and, and with militant might your, uh, your country, right? And you're transgressing your own borders. So America, uh, you know, Christian nationalism is essentially the idea that I have a, a vision for my country. It's a Christian vision for my country. It includes lots of people from all over the place. You want to come and join our story? Come and join our story. And be a part of our story. We, our story is a collective. And there's many different stories in our story. But we are a story that is committed to liberty and freedom. And, and yeah, we don't have a perfect past. But we're, we, we have a good God. And we're, we're gonna, when we're celebrating the wins that we have, you hearing me? That's Christian nationalism. Okay, let's keep going. Here's another one. America is evil. I'm ashamed to be an American. 
Okay, R response. America's evil compared to who? Right? Okay, y yes, yes, that, yes, America is imperfect. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I can tell you, I mean, my family is imperfect, for sure. Come to the Finocchios on Thanksgiving. You know what I mean? No, fam we're no, no family is a family of angels. Doesn't, that's not how it works. You hear me? There's dysfunction, of course. Uh, but compared to which, which sorry, which, which nation are you talking about where you're going to be more free? Right? Wh which, sorry, which one? Which one is it? <laughs> which one? In, in which country are people less oppressed? Right, you hear me? It, I'm not saying that we're all the way where we should be. I'm just saying, you know, compared to who? I mean, who would you rather be? <laughs> you know? Um, yes, America's imperfect, but Americans have reason to celebrate things too. Yeah. <laughs> There's reason to celebrate. Okay. Um, you know, on, on Thanksgiving, I don't go through the litany of all the things that, my, that I don't like about my parents. <laughs> Can you imagine? Well, Mom, you, you got us to school late every day. <laughs> you know, honestly, it was embarrassing, Mother. You know, and then dinner? <sighs> Two out of five. Two out of five, Mom. <laughs> Uh, Christians, this is another one. Uh, Christians uh, use the Bible to, to defend slavery. Okay? Um, Christians using the Bible defended slavery. And that's true. But Christians using the Bible destroyed slavery. You hear me? The, the abolitionist movement was a Christian movement. Um, now, even Satan uses the Bible to get what he wants. I don't know if you're familiar, but in you know, two, two major times that Satan tried to, you know, when he came at, at Adam and Eve, you know, he was twisting God's words and, and, and manipulating God's words. Um, but do you remember when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness? He quoted scripture the whole time. Right? That, like... People, not, people taking scripture out of context is what the devil even does. It's a brilliant tactic. But how did Jesus respond to Satan? He quoted scripture in context. You hearing me? So we don't, we don't abandon the Bible. We don't abandon Christianity. What we do is we, we blame bad people. I mean, you can find a scripture verse for basically anything that you want. You hearing me? You know, like, that's, that's, what, that's what cults do. They find a scripture verse, and then they, you know, they, they all start, you know, doing whatever it is that they, they want to do. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, postmodernism. Postmodernism. Postmodernism is aimed at the way that we decide... Uh, reality, how, how we interpret reality and how we, our epistemology is the technical term, um, how we know what is true, our process of knowing what is true. And so the statements, postmodern statements go like this, um, we are incapable of escaping our internal biases. Truth is local to the knower. You can't really know what's true and depending on where you are on the intersectional scale, you can know what reality is, but you can't transcend those things. And a response to that, and I'm going to unpack this statement. It might go over some of our heads, but I'm going to unpack it. Um, a response to that would be, well, truth exists both experientially, as in we experience it, and outside of ourselves. A tree can be described accurately and experienced. For example, if, you, if I tell you, hey, man, that's a tree, and you're like, dude, it's just your internal biases saying that. I'm like, okay, well, go ahead and drive into it. You will experience the truth of a tree. Now, you can either experience that or you can take my word for it. 
that reality does exist. Don't pretend that we're incapable, you know, because we're, uh, because we're, we're, things are subjective, that we, that, ob, that total, ob, now, total objectivity cannot be known, but we can become increasingly objective, right? And in postmodernism, you know, people just run rampant with this, well, because, you know, total objectivity cannot be known, then let's just be subjective about everything. It's like, no, that's ridiculous. All right, let's keep going. This one's a mouthful. The world is divided into oppressors and oppressed. Oppressors created the systems, structures of the world, like Christianity. Sometimes people, one of their objections to Christianity is that it's a white religion, which is not true. Most Christians are not white. It's, it's, it's just true. Most Christians are brown. They're, 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 they're from Africa. They're from India. They're from, like, Christianity is blowing up, and it's, it's still um, a global south phenomenon. And, and, and to, to make another point, um, two of the greatest theologians in the church were both African. Athanasius uh, of Alexandria and, um, and Augustine. Um, so when people are saying, well, we need, we need more African theology, I'm like, I agree. Read Augustine. Um, you know, <laughs> okay, let's keep going. I get, I'm sorry, I get sidetracked. In my, the, you would, there's fireworks going off in my brain right now. <laughs> I'm having my own party up here. <laughs> Oppression is hidden from oppressors and obvious to the oppressed. There's an element of truth to that. Thus, oppressors cannot know truth in the same way the oppressed can. There's an element of truth in that people have various and variant experiences in life. This is why we need to deplatform white men and recenter women and people of color, those who know how the world actually works. There's an element of truth to that. But then a response would be, whose theology should we platform, Oprah Winfrey or T.D. Jakes? You don't just know what's true because of your gender or your skin color. That's not how it works. The reason why I would prefer T.D. Jakes is because he's a fire Bible teacher and he's, he's a prophetic voice, um, not because necessarily of his skin color or because of his gender. You hearing me? You hearing me? And Oprah Winfrey isn't a horrible theologian because she's a, a woman who's a person of color or black. It's just that she's a bad theologian. And we know this because, of, because we objectively uh, measure her theology to the scriptures. You hearing me? Are you following me here? Okay, let's keep moving. Here's another statement. This is, the, this is a spicy statement, but, but bear with me here. The world is divided. Oh, here we go. We should never ch uh, challenge lived experience. There's an element of truth to that, that people do have lived experiences and they're very real. And we do want, ex we do require experiences of the things that we believe. Experience is important in life, okay? Um, my wife has had experiences that I've never had. My, my, you know, my wife riding on the New York subway has experienced things um, that I've never experienced, okay, as a, as a woman. Okay, you hearing me? Uh, there's an element of truth to that, so it's, it's profound. And we're gonna unpack this in, in the next one as well. But a response, which proposition is true, okay? As a woman, I know that society is deeply sexist. As a black man, I know that society is deeply racist. As a lesbian, I know my sexuality is how God made me. As a Muslim, I know Islam is true. And this is where I'm getting at here. If you're going to be consistent, you have to accept all of those statements in terms of elevating lived experience over biblical or objective truth, okay? As Christians, we can't allow lived experience to be the, the number one thing that decides what's true. Are you hearing me? Okay, it can't take precedence over biblical and objective evidence. Now, it doesn't mean that somebody's lived experience isn't true, okay? 
And sometimes we do need to listen to people who have had, like listening to my wife telling me what things that have happened to her on the subway. I can't believe it. I, I, I didn't see it because it didn't happen to me. You hear me? Okay. Um, which leads me to, to, my, to my next statement here. We have to believe all women. I want to show you the difference between empathy and rational compassion. And we need both. Okay. As a husband, I show empathy and believe my wife. Right? I'm a husband. If my wife comes home and says, some dude just grabbed my butt on the subway. <laughs> right? I show empathy in that situation. You know? Like, I'm her husband. So I believe you. Okay? And we're going to get to the bottom of this. But I believe you. Right? I'm, I'm showing empathy, putting myself in her situation. But if I'm a judge, it's not my place to show empathy. It's my place to show rational compassion. Okay? And rational compassion, see, because with empathy, it, it, it can be biased. But rational compassion calls us to wade through matters carefully. I don't want judges to show empathy. I want them to be rational. You hearing me? That's biblical justice. When you read through the Old Testament, when you read through the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs is like, hey, you know, Proverbs 18, 13, for example. Somebody who responds to a matter without listening to it is a fool. Right? You know, believe all women. Where did the Me Too, the hashtag Me Too movement come from? Well, there's an element of truth to it. That women couldn't speak up because they were afraid to speak up about being, uh, about sexual assault. You know, you're hearing me. Um, and so... It, it empowers women who have gone through those experiences to say something. And I'm thankful that women feel empowered to say things like that. They should feel empowered to, to say things about traumas that have happened to them. You hear me? Okay? But we don't believe all women. Why? Because that's not justice. And, and my wife told me this, so I'm going to say it. Sometimes women lie. Are you hearing my heart? My heart is that there's elements of truth to things, but we can't throw out biblical justice. We have to wade through things. I will mourn with those who mourn that are not my wife. I'll mourn with my wife. Are you hearing me? But I can't show empathy to the whole world. I have to walk in rational compassion in my world. And so I will mourn when all the details of a matter have been heard. You hearing me? Okay, uh, I'm not going to jump to conclusions. I'm not going to, you hearing me? I think as Christians, we could be a lot more measured. You hearing me? Sometimes we do lack compassion. And if you're somebody who lacks compassion, then ask the Lord to give you more compassion. We should, in fact, we should be just like Jesus who was moved by compassion. Right? Um, but there's, a, there's a, a pendulum swing where People are trying to say that justice is now empathy. Justice is not empathy. Justice is rational compassion. Let's keep moving. Um, here's another statement. We're almost done, okay, guys? I know you can basically taste those hot dogs, and you're just like, oh, I'm dying. <laughs> Next statement, I'm deconstructing because the church is deeply flawed. Here's a response. You are deeply flawed too. <laughs> oh, you, oh, the church has problems? Well, shocker. Remember, you know, like, yes, the church has problems because you're here, you know. <laughs> and what if your problems with the church are ideological and not theological? Which often happens. It's like, you know, these kids have been shaped and formed uh, by... Look, I, 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 I'm not going to come. I went to a, the public. I was in a private Christian school for most of my life, and I, I was in public uh, education. And, and public education, um, y'all y- y- know this. Y'all know that, that, that there's ideologies out there that are shaping and forming kids. Okay? I, I'm a firm believer in Christian education. I know that not everybody can have access to Christian education. It's just not a reality. My, my, my dad was a used car salesman, um, and, um, you know, and, and, and 
my parents sacrificed to put us through, uh, you know, school, and and um, it was it was just a value. And they're just like we, we we're just, we're not you know we're we're not going to send you to the public school at your young age. So you'll you know you'll go to high school. Um, but <laughs> so all that to say, they kind of prepared us. But kids are shaped and formed by these secular visions. And then they begin to critique Christianity through somebody else's lens. And then, you, and then we wonder why our kids are, are deconstructing. Like, how did that happen? Well, I don't know. Maybe you sacrificed your children on the altar of secularism. You know, like, the, the, the amount of cleanup that I joyfully do is staggering. Uh, but, you know, kids are shaped by their university and TikTok. That's what happens. And so what I continue to argue is, hey, man, it's probably better to not place yourself at the, you know, as the center of authority. And rather, dude, grow in your knowledge of the Lord. You know, there's 2,000 years of historic Christian orthodoxy where Christians generally believe all the same things. You know, for 2,000 years? Start there. Rather than read peripheral heretics who satisfy your cultural biases. There's a lot of pressure on young people because uh, there's a crisis of authority. People are trying to find out who the authority is. And right now, the authority is the self. And that's kind of the point of postmodernism. Is it's my experiences and it's what I think. Everything that I think and everything that I experience, I am the, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You hearing me? And it, th that's why self-authoring and self-development and self-help and self-authenticating and self-discovery are so big in our generation because there's all this pressure on me to decide what is true because people don't trust the church or they don't trust this or they don't trust that. And postmodernism ultimately has a lot to do with it. Postmodernism is, is, is wild cynicism. People are cynical about everything. But when we begin to read, this is why G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis, for example, they saw this and prophetically they wrote about it. They said, hey, like every generation, they called, they called a modern thought chronological snobbery. And essentially what it is, it's like, well, it's, you know, it's 2021. We know everything now. <laughs> I like to remind students that, like, the greatest art in the world was created 600 years ago. And it's all gone downhill. <laughs> like, like, we peaked at William Shakespeare. You, th like, measurably, that is accurate. Like, our greatest literature has already been written. Sorry. You know, go read Dante. Go read Milton. You hearing me? But we seem to, we seem to think that we have it. We, we know everything because it's, it's 2021. Chronological snobbery. Another issue is that every generation has problems with Scripture. So, for example, one of the problems, this is the last statement that I'll make, and then, and, and then we're going to read a passage of Scripture and we'll be done. But one of the problems that my generation has is with hell. My grandparents didn't have a problem with hell. The World War II generation? Dude, they knew people were going to hell. I mean, my, you know, my, they sent people there with bullets. <laughs> you know, all over Europe. Battlefields. You know, like it was, it was crazy. But they knew that evil existed. You hear me? They never, they never wondered if there was sin in the world. They faced sin. You hearing me? They had other questions about God. But t today, we, we have very unique questions. And so what happens, though, is we read all of our modern theologians, and we read our modern heretics, and we read our modern, you know, analysis, and we never read past generations. And past generations help us. They stabilize us. And young readers, young people who are deconstructing, they think that they're the ones who have to solve all of the theological problems. They don't understand that there's 2,000 years of church history of people reading the same scripture verses. Maybe it's worth finding out how the church read this scripture verse 200 years ago. And the church before that 100 years ago. And the church before that 100. You hearing me? 
that will help you eclipse some of your biases. Allow the, 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 the sea breeze of the past to blow through your modern mind. This is how I, was, I would respond to I don't believe in hell. Assume that when you get to a place in the Bible that you don't agree with, you're the one that's wrong. <laughs> right? What if... <laughs> What if, rather than projecting onto God what he should be like, which is generally, you know, you know, well, my Jesus, I, w I could never serve a God that had hell. Well, you're that God. You just created God in your own image. Right? What if, rather than projecting onto God what he should be like, you allowed him to self-define? Our young people are so passionate about self-definition, but they don't allow, allow God to self-define. No, I'm not like that. I'm like this. Stop trying to manipulate me. Well, you should try that with God. God's God. He's not you. You're not more merciful than him. You know what I mean? I, I could never believe in a God that has hell. He's just not merciful. You're not as mer You don't love people more than God loves people. Stop that. Stop playing that. That's ridiculous. God is so infinitely wise. He's so infinitely loving. He's so infinitely merciful. And the day that he judges the earth will be cause for praise forever and ever and ever because his righteous judgment will be so perfect that it will blow us away. God can be trusted. He can be trusted. I want to read this passage and then we're going to end. This is a story about Elijah. And he's the burned out prophet. He's tired. He's hangry. And kind of like you right now. You're, you're hangry. You can taste those hot dogs. And so here we, here we go. And so Ahab and Jezebel are after him. And Elijah was afraid, this is verse 3, 1 Kings 19. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a, a bush and he sat down under the bush and he prayed that he might die. Talk about depressed. You know, imagine this guy, I want to die. I want to die, Lord. Kill me. Kill me now, God. Really powerful time of prayer. And, um, and he said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. And at once an angel touched him and, and said, get up and eat. And he looked around and there by his head was some bread baking over hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate and he drank and then he lay down. And the guy, he took a nap. He needed a, he needed a nap. And he needed to eat. And so then the angel comes back and wakes him up, hey, eat some more. You're, you're, you need to eat some more. Um, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank and strengthened by that food. The guy then traveled 40 days and 40 nights. It was like a supernatural meal that God equipped him with for the journey that was ahead of him. And so then we know the story, you know, and he, he so he's looking for God and he journeys to Mount Horeb and he gets to the mountain and, and God's like, why are you here? And Elijah's like, well, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant and they've torn down your altars and they've put your prophets to death with the sword and I am the only one left. I'm the only Christian left, God. And now they're trying to kill me too. And so the Lord said, go and stand you know, on the mountain in the presence of the Lord because the Lord's about to pass by. So... You know, there's a, there's a wind, and God's not in the wind. And then there's an earthquake, and God's not in the earthquake. And then there's a fire, and God's not in the fire. But then he was in this still, small voice. And then the Lord speaks to him, really, Elijah, why are you here? And he replies again, dude, I just told you. And he verbatim, copy and paste, he says the exact same thing again. He's like, I've been really zealous, okay? The Israelites are messed up. They're killing people. Our pets' heads are falling off. And I'm the only one left. I am the only Christian left, and they're trying to kill me too. And the Lord said to him, dude, go back to the way you came. 
and go and anoint Jehu and and I'm going to work for you and I'm, these good things are going to happen. Um, I'm going to work in, in Israel. And then Elijah went from there and he went and he found Elisha who was plowing and Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him and then Elisha left his oxen and ran after Elijah. And it's just the story of this burnt out prophet who's going, God, I'm the only Christian left. And God's like, you're hangry. You just need to take a nap. Have, eat some food. There's 7,000. There's a remnant of 7,000 that have not bowed to me. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes we feel so alone. You know what I mean? Like, God, America's going to hell. You know, like, God's like, take a nap. Eat a hot dog. There is, there's a remnant of 7,000. Like, Jesus, Jesus is ruling his church. Right? Jesus is ruling his church, and God's plans will not be thwarted. Je- Jesus isn't coming back for, like, some lame, blind, crippled church. He's coming back for a beautiful and glorious bride. You hear me? The the gates of hell will not prevail, as in the church is attacking hell and and plundering hell. That's the biblical vision. The vision is not that we're holding on for dear life and it's just like, oh, we're losing. No, the church is going to be beautiful. And we just need to continue to, okay, God, I'm here. I'm serving you. I'm going to continue to eat the food that you have me to eat. And eat the word, eat your word, and, and, and be in your presence, and, and receive and hear from you, Lord. And, but, Lord, I know that I'm, I'm not going to get exhausted. I'm going to get up and eat. I'm going to take a nap. And I'm just going to trust that you are going to accomplish the things that you seek to accomplish in your church and in our country. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's sing this out. Let's sing this out. Crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated. Yeah. You are. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every night. Come on, if you're grateful that God has conquered the grave, he has conquered this world, we have nothing to fear. Come on, can we lift up a 4th of July shout of praise? Can we please thank Pastor Nathan Finocchio for preaching, for teaching? Well, guys, we have ice cream, hot dogs, games, fun, fellowship, whatever you want to call it. Our team is going to play here for just a little bit longer if you want to stay worship for a second but why don't you guys head outside our team's going to be opening up the ushers are going to be opening up the doors over there happy fourth of july come on guys let's lift up a shout of praise happy fourth of july we love you church have a great rest of your week ice cream out that way hot dogs out that way fun and games out that way god bless you all we'll see you this wednesday night 7 p.m summer pulpit series Always.